Three. It is my honor and privilege to introduce the next speaker in this CCA series. Robert D. Kaplan is Chief Geopolitical Analyst for Stratfor, a private global intelligence firm and a non-resident fellow at the Center for a New American Security. Mr. Kaplan served as a member of the Pentagon's Defense Policy Board under Secretary of, State, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates and as the Class of 1960 Distinguished Visiting Professor in National Security at the United States Naval Academy, Annapolis. A consultant to the U.S. Army's Special Forces Regiment, the U.S. Air Force, and the Marines, he is a foreign correspondent for The Atlantic, and his essays have been featured in The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Financial Times, and The Wall Street Journal. He is the author of several books, including Balkan Ghosts, A Journey Through History, Warrior Politics, and most recently, The Revenge of Ge Geography, What the Map Tells Us About Coming Conflicts and the Battle Against Fate. Please join me in welcoming Robert D. Kaplan. Um. Good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's really a great privilege to be back at Hillsdale. I spoke here 25 years ago in the spring of 1988, and my subject then was the Ethiopian famine, where I had just completed a book about. And uh, throughout the 80s, I covered the wars in Ethiopia, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, and, and, and so forth. And since then, I've been doing just more of the same, um, just uh, finding different places of the world to write about. And um, le let me just say that I'm going to be talking about a subject today that's a bit tender. It, it, it will be a bit hard to listen to in certain ways because what Hillsdale is about and what many of you about, are about is all the things that human beings can accomplish. All, you know, overcoming adversity, um, putting your mind to something and accomplishing it, about the power of human agency, as the intellectuals call it. And what I'm gonna be talking about is different. It's gonna be about constraints, the limitations um, that, uh, that we all labor under. Uh, let me put it this way. If you read the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal and then turn to the editorial page of the New York Times um, or, the editor or read the National Review and then read The Nation, um, you would think, oh, this is different. Some are liberal, some are conservative. In a sense, they're all the same. Because what it's all about is the power of ideas the power of what uh, Washington can accomplish if only it would do this and that and the other things. Um, the elite, and, 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 and all of these journals of opinion and op-ed pages um, deal with, um, they, they're written by and they deal with an elite. And, what el and elite molders of public opinion fly back and forth across the earth in business class. Uh, and they look down from 30,000 feet, and they think they can engineer reality from above. And that's all true to an extent. Uh, human beings can accomplish many things. A lot of the ideas you read about in your journal, your favorite journals, are very coherent ones. But what I'm here to talk about is the other 50% of reality, the constraints the limitations, and principle among those constraints is geography. And by geography, I do not just mean the map in front of us. I mean geography in the 19th century sense of the word, in the sense of not just mountains and rivers and plains and coastlines, I mean also natural resources, population, uh, pathways of trade, um, 
the environment, the environment in a strategic sense, not in an aesthetic uh, 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 spotted owl sense. Let's save the spotted owl. I mean, the environment in terms of what are the underground sources of fresh water for a country like China or Yemen? And are they running out of such sources? That's what I mean when I talk about the environment. Um, and let me, let me go around the world and give you a sense of this. This is not about how human beings are just slaves to fate, how they're prone to forces so large that there's little that they could do to overcome them. This is just a way to look more, to see a more powerful version of the Earth and to give you another, a, an added layer of perspective to, that goes in addition to all the layers that you already do have. Uh, I'm going to start with the Middle East, and I'm going to go around the world in the next half hour. The Arab Spring, the so-called Arab Spring, which was really not about democracy. It was instead a crisis in central authority. And when that central authority imploded, there was often nothing to, uh, uh, nothing to replace it. The Arab Spring began in Tunisia. Why did it begin in Tunisia? If you look at the map of the Mediterranean and the Middle East, you will see that no Arab country was closer to Europe than Tunisia. It's only seven hours by slow car ferry from Tunis to Trapani in western Sicily. It's a car ferry I've taken several times in my life. Throughout medieval and early modern history, the links between what is today Italy and what is today uh, Tunisia were immense. They were extraordinary, interwoven. No Arab country was as interwoven with European culture as the coast of Tunisia. Uh, if you look at a road map of Tunisia, you'll find that most of the roads were built by the Romans today's roads, and they were enhanced by the Byzantines and the Vandals and the Turks and, 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 uh, and, and others. Tunisia was, was not just an empty place on a map. It was an age-old cluster of civilization that was an extension of Europe in, its, in the northern third of the country. So, the Arab Spring began in the most Europeanized part of the Arab world. This was no accident. It was a part of the Arab world that because it was so Europeanized, it had a very well-developed state mentality. Identity was not just about Islam. Identity was about being a Tunisian, which had a state had a motor vehicles bureau, had an agricultural extension service. It had institutions and bureaucracies and electricity grids and stoplights and garbage service that actually worked. The very mundane things that we take for granted often do not exist in many parts of the developing world, but they existed in Tunisia. And yet, when the Romans uh, finally conquered Carthage, because what is Tunisia but age-old greater Carthage? When the Romans finally conquered Carthage, they dug a demarcation ditch in 202 BC called in Latin a fossa regia. And this demarcation ditch delineated civilized territory from uncivilized territory. And the demarcation ditch went several hundred miles south from the Mediterranean into the desert, and then east back to the Mediterranean, because Tunisia has both an eastern coastline and a northern coastline on the Mediterranean. And everywhere inside of that ditch, between the Mediterranean and that ditch, was where the roads were built, was where a state was developed in antiquity. And everywhere outside of that ditch was left to disuse. And, and if you look at Tunisia's development map, at its demographic map to this day, the moment you get outside that ditch, the roads disappear, unemployment shoots up, you, you suddenly, the poverty rate increases dramatically. Lo and behold, 
the Arab Spring began in the most Europeanized country in the Arab world, but, the, but in a town that lay outside that demarcation ditch. Um, uh, the fruit and vegetable uh, vendor who lit himself on fire and committed suicide because of unemployment and lack of jobs and lack of opportunity did so in a town way outside that ditch. So this is not a fatalistic or deterministic interpretation of recent events. It just adds, as I said earlier, an added layer of understanding to everything else that we have, how geography can infer and infuse a deeper understanding uh, of things. History starts with the map. It doesn't end with the map. It starts with the map. In the long term, over 20, 30 years, you can forecast a lot by geography. In the short term, over the next 12 months, uh, then it's more about personalities and the interaction of personalities. Uh, look at Syria in 30 years, I'll talk about geography. Look in Syria in the next week, I'll talk about the interrelationship between Obama and Putin. And, and the Iranians and, and Assad and others. Now let's go beyond Tunisia a bit to give you a deeper flavor of this. What's another age-old cluster of civilization that's been a state really since antiquity with a road network, a river network, Egypt of course. Um, in Egypt there are many problems as we know. Uh, there was uh, a, an, a toppling of, of the dictator, which was not a democratic uprising, regardless of what you read in the newspapers. It was the military using demonstrations to get rid of a leader who wanted to install his son in power, a son who would have liberalized the economy and threatened the military's hold on a lot of the uh, parts of the economy that it owned. Um, the military, the military ejected Mubarak. The military itself was overthrown in popular demonstrations. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood came to power, but then the military reasserted itself. And we're, we're, and we're back with a, a military a general in control who's killed as many people in the streets as Mubarak did, if not more. Egypt, like Tunisia, is under control. It has an army that rules, it has bureaucracies. Its chaos is about politics. It's about who rules and what values they rule the state. But the state itself is not in question. There is a state there. But if you look at what the map shows between Tunisia and Libya, between Greater Carthage and the Nile Valley, what do you have? You have just a vague geographical expression. That in, that in our age goes under the name of Libya. Libya is not a real state. Um, Libya, the northwestern Libya, the capital of Tripoli, is, was historically Tripolitania, and all of the tribes uh, were oriented towards Tunis and Tunisia. And northeastern Libya, Cyrenaica, including the city of Benghazi, were always oriented towards Alexandria and the Nile Valley. And Cyrenaica and Tripolitania had very little to do with each other historically. The Italians did not make a state. And lo and behold, precisely because Libya is, was not a real state, it required an extreme suffocating form of authoritarianism to hold it together under the name of Gaddafi's rule. If you look at a map of North Africa from Morocco to Egypt, you will see, and you look at where the Roman settlements were, you will see that they clustered around what is today Morocco, what is today uh, uh, Tunisia, and what is today Egypt. All the states that had relatively moderate forms of dictatorship, Egypt, Tunisia, and the king of Morocco. They may not have been Democrats, but they were not on the level of authoritarianism as Gaddafi, or even of the Algerian generals for much of Algeria's modern history, which also, Algeria, like Libya, is another vague geographical expression that's not a real country. When we look at 
dictatorships. Don't be um, stereotypical. There's all, all different kinds of dictatorships, from the most moderate and liberal forms to the most illiberal and suffocating forms. The king of Morocco, uh, the founder of modern T Tunisia, Habib Bourguiba, the Nasserite pharaohs from Nasser himself to Mubarak in Egypt, were all relatively moderate dictators. You could say what you wanted as long as you didn't actively work against the regime, you, uh, it didn't matter, you were okay. But in places like Libya or another vague geographical expression which called itself a country but was never a country by the name of Syria um, or Iraq, those places required more suffocating forms of of, of dictatorship precisely because of, um, of geography. Um, look at Syria. Uh, Syria is a name, a vague word, for a place between the Taurus Mountains in southern Turkey and the Nefu Desert in northern Saudi Arabia. That includes the modern day countries of Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Israel. In Syria, you have the Shia trending Alawites in the northwest, the Kurds in the northeast, uh, the Sunni Arabs in the this, in this central corridor, and the Druze in the south. They're all regionally based. Loyalty is to ethnicity and sectarian identity, not to a state. And the state was held together under the most brutal means for 30 years under Hafez al-Assad. Um, and Hafez al-Assad was the Brezhnev Chernyenko of the Middle East. He held together a place, but kept his people as subjects and never developed citizenship. And as a result, they never formed a state identity, and their identity was restricted to their groups. And when his son took power and ran into trouble 11 years later, the state identity crumbled, and you have basically a morass of groups um, fighting each other. Why was Saddam Hussein so brutal? When I was in Iraq, in quite a few times in the 1980s reporting on the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, what impressed me was how unlike any other Arab country Iraq was. It was so much more brutal, so much more sterile. It, going from Saddam's Iraq to Hafez al-Assad Syria was like coming up for liberal humanist air. That's how much worse Iraq was than Syria. Why? because you had Kurds in the mountains in the north, you had Sunnis in the center, and you had very tribalized Shias in the south. Because the, the three groups were so suspicious of each other, it required an extreme form of dictatorship to hold them together. So that geography necessitated a form of dictatorship that was far more extreme than Egypt, where geography led to a natural coherent country, uh, the Nile Valley. Yemen is another uh, age-old cluster of civilization, except when you go to Yemen, you see the most beautiful mountains on Earth. But because it's such an extremely mountainous landscape, instead of one ancient culture, you had five or six. You had Sabians, Himyaratis, Hadramutis, and others. And that's why on a good day, the president of Yemen, uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, up until 2011, controlled maybe 50% of the country. And the people who succeeded him, even less. Again, geography rules to a great extent. Um, in, in, and even to, you know, just to divert a minute, look at the United States. Um, we're infused with ideas. Uh, you know, the, we're, uh, Jews, Catholics, Mexicans, Muslims, Hindus, who all become US citizens are all honorary Protestants because they all adopt the Protestant creed. Uh, that's all true. But on the other hand, there are some geographical features that made America great. America was the last resource-rich part of the temperate zone to be settled at the time of the European Enlightenment. America has more miles of navigable inland waterways than the rest of the world combined. 
And unlike Russia, where the great rivers run north to south and thus divide the country, the great river systems in the United States, specifically the Missouri, go in a diagonal fashion, um, northwest to southeast, and the Ohio River system similarly, and therefore they unite this great continent, which, by the way, has more natural resources than any other place of its size on Earth, from uh, strategic minerals and metals to energy and to, you know, to abundant water. So, so remember, geography plays a role, and geography can even infuse a people's moral character. I've always believed and have written that it's the very beauty and just spectacular immensity of the Colorado Plateau, of the mountains of Utah and Colorado itself, that gave the pioneers the sense that there was something special about America and that therefore they had a special destiny different from other countries. The landscape played a role in shaping people's spiritual mentality. Back to the world, I'm running out of time quickly. Um, let me look at Europe just for a few minutes. You read the newspapers about Europe and your eyes blur. It's all economic. Uh, the European Union debt, they're saddled in debt. Uh, Germans don't want to retire at 70, so Greeks can retire at 55. Um, um, the Northern Europeans think the Southern Europeans are inefficient and, and, and lazy and all. What's going on here? It's more than economics, it's geography too. If you look at the, um, at all the great treaty towns of the European Union, the Hague, Maastricht, Strasbourg, uh, 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 the others, um, you will find that Leiden, they, all, they cohere perfectly with Charlemagne's ninth century empire. Um, that the heartland of the European Union, the richest part of Europe economically, is Charlemagne's old empire. Why is that? Because that's the Europe united by a river system with rich, deep soils that nevertheless have an opening to the Atlantic and, it, and, and to the Baltic Sea, but at the same time, because of a screen of islands in Holland, have, 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 a, have a, an immensity of protected harbors at natural harbors at the same time. So that it's natural that Europe developed with the, the, the economic and political strength would be in the northwest of Europe. It's also natural that the poorest, most economically troubled part of Europe would be the extreme southeast in Greece, which historically is a child of Byzantine and Turkish despotism because of geography that when we look at Europe, we're really seeing the different economic and development patterns of the Prussian Empire, the Habsburg Empire, the Byzantine Empire, the Turkish Empire, Southern Mediterranean Europe, uh, and they all developed along different patterns economically, which led to different political patterns. So it was a, it was a very ambitious idea to put all of these people under one currency. Um, and not only one currency, but one currency where, uh, without one political system, it, you know, it, 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 in order to make the proper adjustments through a central bank to fix things. So that Europe is redividing in a very subtle way, more or less according to the to, um, uh, to, to age-old imperial patterns. If when the, the day the Berlin Wall fell, if you looked at a map, and you had to make a guess, how would the former Warsaw Pact countries do? You could have predicted on the map how they would do at least for the next 20 years. You would say Poland and the Baltic states in the north would do the best, hairs to the Prussian tradition. Um, Hungary and che what was then Czechoslovakia would do second best, hair to the Haps Habsburg crown land tradition. And the most troubled places would be in the Balkans. Uh, which were here to, to a much weaker economic development pattern, first under the Byzantine Empire until the mid-15th century, and then the Ottoman Turkish Empire. And 
And that wasn't just true of Yugoslavia, which as we know erupted into war, but of near anarchy and periodic cases of anarchy in Albania and Bulgaria, and very weak, extremely corrupt, slow growth economy like Romania. Um, so the map teaches a lot. Let me go beyond Europe to Russia for a minute. Um, Russia exists almost completely north of 50 degrees north latitude. Um, that's cold. Now Canada is more or less similar, but everyone in Canada lives along the US border, essentially. Canada is like Chile laid on its side, you know? Um, <laughs> That's what it is. Canada is a demographic extension of the United States. 300 million plus Americans live in America, an extra 33 million live just north of the border. But Russia's different. Russia's great population zones, Moscow, St. Petersburg, are far north of that 50 degrees north latitude. In fact, the only places south of the Caucasus, which is Russia's tropical area, even though it's only around Maine or so, um, in terms of latitude, and in the extreme far east around Vladivostok because of the uh, moderating influence of, of the Western Pacific and where it dips down, it's a bit warmer as well. All right, that harsh, that extreme cold led to a certain communalism. It led to a belief, uh, uh, it, it led to, you know, extreme, and that communalism led to an extreme religious intensity. Um, it was said that um, if you wanted to understand Stalinism, forget Marxist theory, just look at the Russian Orthodox Church, which was all about totality and you know, about to totalism, total belief, everything. And St remember, Stalin was a seminary student in Georgia. He studied for the Orthodox priesthood. And his, and his rhetoric very much came out of that tradition. Russian communism is impossible to understand without at least some reference to the environment and to the geography. Now, the most important things about Russia is Russia is a land empire and land empires are notoriously insecure, especially if you have a land empire that has no mountains as natural, or rivers as natural borders. Russia hasn't just been invaded by Napoleon and Hitler, but by the Swedes, the Lithuanians, and the Poles, too. Um, so Vladimir Putin, rather than being this evil demon that the media makes him out to be, is just a normal Russian autocrat who, um, who looks at Europe and says, I need a buffer zone. Uh, the Warsaw Pact may be dead, okay, and I'm not gonna resurrect it because that's what killed the Soviet Union, having to support those infernal countries like Poland and Hungary and others. But I need a soft, traditional zone of influence in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, in order to guard about against future invasion likes, because I'm, in, I'm incessantly insecure about Europe because I'm a loyal Russian and I know my history. And therefore, I'm gonna buy up rail lines, infrastructure, banks, I'm gonna subvert these countries through intelligence operations. Uh, I'm not gonna use my army, but I'm gonna use everything else to undermine every country from the Baltics to the Balkans. Um, I need a buffer zone in the Caucasus to, you know, to protect me against is Islamic anarchy and, fundament, um, and fundamentalism. And I need to compete with the Chinese in Central Asia because it was a long border in the Far East between Russia and China that led to the Sino-Soviet split in the first place where you had a million men under arms and it was that, that geography that provided Nixon and Kissinger with the opportunity in the first place to triangulate China against the Soviet Union because of China's fear of the Soviet Union because of a long unprotected border. So Russia has no mountains to protect it. Its rivers go in the wrong direction. The rivers further decide the Far East from Central, from Siberia and Central Siberia from Western Siberia. And then you have the Ural, Urals, which separate Western Siberia from European Russia. 11 time zones, yet less people than Bangladesh. 
If you ruled Russia, you would be very insecure. And you would always be looking for opportunities to undermine the West um, wherever you could, even if you were a democratically elected ruler. Let's move on. Let's look at China. China is south of 50 degrees north latitude. China is like the United States. Uh, the coldest part, Manchuria, Harbin, is the latitude of Maine. The warmest part, Hainan Island in the South China Sea, is the latitude of the Florida Keys. And you have everywhere in between. And you had the canal built in the 6th century between the Yangtze and the Yellow River, which for China was like the Transcontinental Railroad, uniting the country. So China's in the, in the perfect latitudes. It's opened up to, to, the, to Central Asia with its strategic minerals and metals. Um, it, has a, it, it has a massive population of 1.3 billion people. In the Russian Far East, you have 7 million going down to 4.5 million because of the demographic crisis. You have China pushing into Central Asia, building roads, rail lines, pipelines for natural gas and oil. You have China proposing a divide and conquer strategy versus the economies of Southeast Asia. China is bigger on the map than it looks, but China is also much smaller and claustrophobic. Because if you're an ethnic Han Chinese, you look to your northern border lands and you have inner Mongolians. You look to your western border lands and you have ethnic Uyghur Turkic Muslims. And you look to your southwestern border lands and you have Tibetans, and they all hate you. And they all live on the upland plateaus. That's where all the water sources are. That's where all the energy and minerals are. So you're just a small Han cradle core of an island in central and coastal China. And you know that the Americans lecture you about human freedom and democracy, but you know better if you're the Politburo of China. You know a little democracy is going to lead to more and more ethnic disturbances uh, throughout China. So you listen politely to your American interlocutors and then ignore them afterwards. Um, because China, like Russia, in a way, in a smaller way, is a prison of nations. And the minute that prison opens up, you have, um, uh, you, uh, you know, you have the prospect of a, of a greater Tibet, which India can use against China, and um, and um, and on and on. Uh, let me talk about Iran for a moment. Iran's interesting. Um, it, I talked about artificial countries in the Middle East: uh, Libya, Syria, Algeria, Iraq. I talked about Yemen is partially artificial, not wholly artificial. There's nothing artificial about Iran. Iran's a real state. In fact, as, as Syria and Iraq crumble, and Lebanon and Jordan are under stress, the only two vibrant states between the eastern edge of the Mediterranean and the Central Asian Plateau is a Jewish state and a Persian state. Keep that in mind. There is nothing artificial about Iran. Persia was the first great superpower in antiquity. Um, uh, if you look at the maps of the various Persian empires, the Medes, the Parthians, the Achaemenids, the Sassanids, the Qajars, and others, what you find is it roughly approximates the area of Iranian influence today. Uh, Lebanon, Syria, certainly Iraq, um, Western and Central Afghanistan. Uh, Iran has a terrorist network of sort, empire of sorts from the Mediterranean to Central Afghanistan. Um, Iran, uh, Persia, historically, has had very close relations with the Jews. Persia, historically, has had very bad relations with the Arabs. Um, Persia, historically, will be around for decades and decades to come, because I said it's a real state. I cannot promise you that Saudi Arabia will exist for decades and decades to come, because Saudi Arabia is artificial, though I never got to talk about it. Saudi Arabia is not uh, contigu is, is not synonymous with the Ara trapezoidal Arabian Peninsula. 
in the way that Iran is synonymous with the Iranian plateau, with the, um, with the Iranian plateau. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if 10 years from now, the United States had closer relations with Iran than it has today with Turkey or Saudi Arabia. Um, and I infer this from geography. I infer that there's a lot that the US and Iran have to talk to each other about. They can each do each other a lot of good in a naked strategic fashion. Um, the, the worst nightmare of the Saudis in Riyadh, the absolute worst, which infuses so many of their conspiracy theories, is that the U.S. will have a rapprochement with Iran. Um, that's what really scares, that's the Saudi nightmare, that Saudi Arabia has, has dwindling underground fresh water sources, that it has 40% male youth unemployment, that the royal family inner circle is spreading from about 20 to several hundred as, as, the, as, 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 as the sons of the favored wife of Ibn Saud, uh, Sudair, die off and, and you know, just conjuries of grandchildren um, emerge fighting for the spoils and, and, the, and the power structure is split up. And meanwhile, the Iranians and the Americans find they have a lot to discuss around the table. And if they can get by this nuclear issue, um, uh, I, I think you're gonna see a very, very different Middle East. Um, let me, um, let me close with the Western Hemisphere. Let me talk a little bit about the Western Hemisphere. And back to China for a second. China is, uh, push, is projecting power out into the South China Sea. Uh, it's, and that's you know naval, air, and ballistic missile power into the South China Sea. It's making countries like the Philippines and Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore very nervous. One thing I can tell you, American hard military power may not be very popular in Europe, but one place where it's really popular is Asia. Uh, the Asians love American aircraft carriers and fighter jets, because um, that's what helps them balance against China. Um, it, China's push into the South China Sea has made Vietnam America's new and best de facto ally in Asia. Um, the Vietnamese don't love us, they love themselves. And they need us to balance against China. Because as the Vietnamese tell me, we fought one war against the United States. We fought about 35 against China, um, you know, over the course of the millennia. Um, and by the way, in that one war, we defeated you. So we have no axes to grind, chips on our shoulder, or grudges to bear about you. We can meet you psychologically as equals, and therefore, we're in no way intimidated by your power. We need, uh, the, the, the Vietnamese at this moment are dredging and refurbishing Cameron Bay Naval Station in order to invite in more US warships. Um, they want US warships uh, on the Vietnamese coast. This is all because of Chinese power, and now back to the New World. What is the South China Sea to China? It's what the Greater Caribbean was to the United States. Um, in, if you were a foreign policy aficionado in the 19th century and early 20th, and you were very ambitious, what area of the world would you become a specialist in? The Caribbean. The Caribbean now is just for holiday makers, but it wasn't always the case. Um, it was by coming to dominate the greater Caribbean, meaning the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea, that the United States came to dominate the New World because the greater Caribbean was what's called the American Mediterranean. Um, it basically uh, uh, Yorktown, to uh, uh, Yorktown to the Guianas, it was called, in terms of British colonial, um, 
British colonial history. Um, the, the, new, the Western Hemisphere is not geographically divided between North America and South America. It's divided between that area north of the Amazonian jungle and south of the Amazonian jungle. Because the Caribbean is a connector, not a divider. Whereas the Amazon is a real impenetrable divider, at least until very, very recently. If you look at a demographic map of Venezuela, Colombia, the Guianas, you say, oh, they're all in South America, but you look at where the people in those countries actually live. It's all along the Caribbean coast. They're Caribbean countries. And by coming to dominate in a naval sense, uh, a large measure due to Teddy Roosevelt and other presidents, America got dominance of the whole Western Hemisphere north of the Amazonian jungles. Uh, and south of the Amazonian jungles, all you had was the southern cone, uh, which didn't come into economic prominence until the last few decades, um, really. So the Caribbean was the secret sauce that allowed America to gain control of the Western Hemisphere. And once it gained control of the Western Hemisphere, it became a true hemispheric hegemon. And as a hemispheric hegemon, it had power to spare to affect the balance of power in the Eastern Hemisphere. And that is the story of the 20th century. Uh, America affecting the balance of power in World War I, World War II, the Cold War, all because of the Caribbean. It all started with the Caribbean. Um, and this is what the Chinese want for the South China Sea. The control of the South China Sea allows them, uh, allows them an opening to the Indian Ocean. Uh, as, as a major air and naval power in the Western Pacific, China's a great regional power. As a great air and naval power in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, it's a great global power. Um, so again, this is where geography infuses us. Let me just end with this. We think that because of computers, electronic communications, jet travel, that geography is being negated. Geography is not being negated. It's just becoming more claustrophobic. Um, every place matters now and interacts with every other place to a degree that it didn't in previous centuries. We used to be able to say, oh, South America doesn't matter. Africa is of secondary importance. Not anymore. I didn't even talk about Africa, but maybe in the questions and answers I could get into it. But every place interrelates. It's like my watch. If I, it, it's small. But if I take it apart, it's, it's very complex gears within gears within gears. And a relief map of the Earth is incredibly complex, and yet it in teaches, teaches us more and more about this in increasingly shrinking world we live in. Thank you very much for your time, and now I'll take questions and answers. <laughs>